Hey guys, it's History Behind the Warrior, and welcome to another God of War video. In today's History of Episode, I thought that we could continue with our coverage of the Norse Pantheon and discuss a very pivotal character to the 2018 installments. The former Valkyrie Queen and ex-wife of Odin, the Vanaheim Goddess Freya. But before we do start, I just wanted to ask, if possible guys, let's try getting this video to about 500 likes. It really supports this video and helps give it that extra push right out the gate. Plus, if you like what we do here, please do subscribe and tick that bell, as it will keep you up to date with all the content we do have going on here. Now, without any further ado, let's begin, shall we? to talk about Freya properly, we must first go far back in time, before the events of the 2018 game in the Norse Pantheon, before Freya and Odin were married, and the Aesir Vanir War. As said before, Freya derives from Vanaheim, being the child of Njord and sister to Freya, the god of sunshine, prosperity, and a number of different things. Freya herself is the goddess of wisdom, love, beauty, and fertility, something quite commonly associated with the Vanir gods, so they were very different from their Aesir counterparts. But do not be fooled by their passive nature, as it didn't mean that the Vanir gods didn't know how to fight. They are very, very capable of handling themselves and along with this, dabbled in their own unique form of magic, Sered. This form of old magic was something that Freya had practiced and had mastered. Being one of the leaders of her people, Freya was and still is a very important figure amongst them, warding off any intruders that may trespass in Vanaheim. Now the realms at this point were still in their early stages of development, so everyone and every race was still trying to find their place in it. One tribe, however, the Ace proved to be a troublesome force to say the least. Raised as warriors from birth, they thrived on conquest and battle, and this led to many small skirmishes across the realms. But it was only until Freya approached them that things took a turn for the worst. You see, Freya's brother wanted to create a good relationship with the Aesir, so that his brothers and sisters could live alongside them in peace. Thus, as a sign of goodwill, he would travel to Asgard and teach them how to seed their their lands, harvest their crops, and even learn a bit of Vanir magic. Things were going extremely well, but once the crops began to rot, so did their care for the Vanir god. Believing him to be a wolf in sheep's clothing, the Aesir would capture and torture Freya for many, many moons. It was only until one fateful day where he was lucky enough to break from his bonds and finally escape to Vanaheim. Once home in the arms of Freya, the heart of the Vanir gods was lit with a fire that could match the ferocity of the Aesir's. So this is actually where the Aesir and Vanir war begins. The following war, regarded as the first war or long war, was an event that seeded a deep form of hatred and resentment in Freya. Having been forced to witness her brothers and sisters perish and die, Freya's spite towards the Aesir grew day by day. But eventually, both sides had reached a tipping point, where if they kept battling each other, there would be nothing left to fight for. So, caught in a stalemate, the Vanir gods would be approached by Odin's advisor, Mimir. Having seen the devastation on both sides, he proposed a deal to the Vanir. Odin would lay down his arms and create peace, if he in turn could take Freya's hand in marriage. Whilst disgusted at the idea of this offer, Freya looked back at the state of her people and what this war had done to them. So filled with sorrow, she would accept his offer, hoping that by doing so, this would allow her people to thrive by unifying them. But quite the opposite had happened. Freya's somewhat sacrifice was in vain, as her fellow Vanir gods saw what she had done as the ultimate form of betrayal, siding with the enemy and even taking his hand in marriage. Despite her best wishes for them, she would be exiled from the realm of Vanaheim. So, with no home, Freya would now tragically be forced to move to Asgard and live in the chambers of Odin. Now, it wasn't all bad. Whilst at first Freya was very uncomfortable and displeased to live amongst the Aesir, she slowly warmed up to their company and hospitality. In due time, Freya would even find comfort in Odin's company, even teaching him a bit of Vanir magic. 
It was only a matter of time before love blossomed between the two. So the peace treaty was indeed a success. And shortly following this, Freya would give birth to Balder, her pride and joy. It's also around this time where Freya would be given the role of Valkyrie Queen, possibly a sign that the Aesir gods had now finally accepted her. But all was not well in Asgard. Odin would be scarred with the knowledge of Asgard's apocalypse, Ragnarok. And because of this, the Allfather would begin to prepare his forces for the oncoming storm. Engulfed by his paranoia and fear, Odin was quickly losing sight of who he was. And this would very quickly take a toll on Freya and Odin's relationship, as their love would very quickly turn into spite, with Odin's actions becoming more and more extreme day by day. His infatuation with Ragnarok had completely deteriorated their relationship, and Odin would even drag Freya into his onslaught. As you see, after Thor's massacre of the Jotuns in Midgar, his hammer would be stolen by the giant Frim, who wanted to bargain with the Aesir, Freya's hand in marriage for Mjolnir's return. Now Thor, disguised with Freya's magic, would travel to Jotunheim to retrieve his hammer and then come back. That was the plan. At least, it was Freya's plan. Behind her back, Thor and Odin wanted to create a stronghold in Jotunheim, as they still wished to harness the giant's powers to look into the future. So, once Thor entered Jotunheim, he massacred Frim and all that stood before him, attempting to echo the massacre of Midgard. And Freya, disgusted by their deception, would teleport Thor back to Asgard, undoing the plan of the Thunderer and Raven King. This was seen as an extreme extreme obstruction of Odin's faith and trust. So following this, the Aesir would begin to look at Freya in a very, very different light. And knowing that remaining in Asgard would possibly spell her end, Freya would begin to make plans to leave Odin. But before she left, she knew who she had to take care of. Boulder. Knowing that being part of Odin's crusade may lead to his death, Freya would bless her son with a spell that granted him with invulnerability to all threats, physical or magical. This was somewhat symbolic of her everlasting love and care for Boulder. He really was her shining light in Asgard and was probably the reason why she stayed with Odin for so long. But Boulder didn't quite see the spell in the same light as his mother. The problem is with this spell is that it was so powerful that whilst it granted Balder with immortality, it had robbed him of the sensations of living. He couldn't smell, he couldn't taste, he couldn't feel. The spell had done its job, but in turn did rob the god of his humanity. And despite his pleas to his mother, Freya refused to break her spell, saying that she did this to protect him. Now displeased with her curse, Balder nearly kills Freya, but could not follow through on the act. Instead, he utters to his mother that he never wishes to see her again, and the two do part ways. Now understandably, this does break Freya's heart, but to her, deep down, she still felt like it was the right thing to do as a mother to protect her child and the last bit of family she has contact with. Shortly after this, she would then go on to cast another spell, but this time on Mimir. Knowing of the advisor's wide and endless knowledge, she couldn't allow someone so smart and close to Odin to be aware of the spell's weakness to mistletoe. Thus, she would bewitch him, having it so he could never utter Baldur's weakness. With this spell cast, she would leave but not before paying yet another price. Odin, having sensed his marriage dissolving, kept a close eye on Freya, and once he knew for sure that she was going to leave him, he would curse her. Not only would he rob her of her Valkyrie wings, but also her fighting spirit. From here, she would be incarcerated to the rotting remains of Midgard, where Freya would be left alone. So at this point, the goddess would be robbed of her fighting spirit, her home, her child, and her identity. With Midgard in a state, Freya would begin to start a new life, finding a friend in a giant tortoise by the name of Charlie. With his assistance, she would create a home beneath his belly and begin to restore her cut-off section of Midgard. It's here where the realm would be restored and flourish with her old Vanir magic. She would be a mother to all animals of her realm, having it be a safe haven and domain for all that were lost. It's here where Freya's life would now begin, taking on the title of Witch of the Woods to hide her own identity, as at this point, she simply wanted to live her life in peace, no matter how empty that life may be. But with that being said, this brings us up to the 2018 installment 
of God of War. Now Freya's first appearance is during the opening sequence of the game, where Kratos is still in the process of teaching Atreus how to hunt. During this sequence, the two come across a magical ball, and they try to kill it with their bow and arrow, but its magical traits prove to be quite troublesome. Eventually, Atreus is able to incapacitate the ball, much to the dismay of Freya. When she sees her injured friend, she immediately rushes to his side, and shouts at Atreus, having both him and the arriving Kratos fix the damage they had done. On their way to her home, she learns of their noble quest, and how the two are travelling together to the highest peak in all of the Nine Realms to spread the ashes of Atreus's mother. This seems to strike a chord with Freya, as she offers her condolences to the two, and does also take a shine to Atreus. With the duo's help, she is able to save her friend, putting him to sleep as he begins to heal from his wounds. But once she sends off Atreus to get Red Roots, she would quickly confront Kratos. Immediately recognising that he is a god from a far away land, she warns him to be careful, as she, better than anyone else, knows what the Aesir gods are capable of. Along with this, she does briefly lecture Kratos, being well aware that Atreus is more than just a mere boy, but a god himself. Something she can tell Kratos is sheltering from him, but despite her advice, it does fall on the deaf ears of the stubborn Spartan. With lamb crest and red root in her possession, she is able to start to cure the boar. But just before the two leave, she would mark the pair with a seal, something that would hide their presence from the eyes of gods. Now, as the two get on with their quest, the relationship between Atreus and Kratos really resonates with her, possibly seeing it as a mirror image of her own relationship with border. Because of this, she reaches out to the two once again, whilst they are travelling to the highest peak in Midgard. Once she sees that they are stopped by the Black Breath, she offers her assistance, telling the two that they require the light of Alfheim if they wish to cleanse Odin's poison. From here, she takes the pair to Midgard's Bifrost Gate, and teaches them how to travel from realm to realm. But as they arrive in Alfheim, the second Freya steps through the gate, Odin's curse immediately kicks in, and Freya is told back into Midgard. The next time Freya meets the two is when they return from the highest peak in all of Midgard as they have learned from Mimir that it wasn't the highest point in all the Nine Realms. That would be located in Jotunheim. So they would travel to Freya's house at the request of Mimir, as well he was now ahead. But when they stumble into her home, the witch would be horrified, as Atreus had acquired mistletoe arrows. In shock, she demanded that he hand them over, seeing them as an omen of darker days. With the mistletoe destroyed, she would then be surprised to actually see the severed head of Mimir. Mimir. She brought Mimir back from the dead, and upon his reanimation, immediately spits in his face, still of course holding disdain towards the people that abandoned her. Mimir unknowingly reveals her identity to Kratos and Atreus, much to the surprise of the two, with Kratos instantly confronting her. Of course, with the Spartans' own long troubled history with trusting gods, he instantly feels a form of spite and distrust towards her. So the two part ways on a very very sour note. But this wouldn't be the last time the two cross paths. Unfortunately for Freya, the next time the two would see each other would be during a very dire situation. While she was relaxing in her home, she would hear a loud knock at her door and instantly knew it was Kratos. At first, she waved this off, having not quite forgiven him for his attitude earlier. But the second she hears that Atreus had fallen ill, she flings her door open and has Kratos take him to her bed. When she lays her eyes upon him, she immediately recognises what was wrong with Atreus. For the longest time, Kratos has been keeping Atreus's godhood a secret, believing that by doing so, he could keep him safe of exposing him to the cruel reality of such a mantle. But as time passes by, Atreus's powers are beginning to manifest, and with no guidance, it would slowly kill him. Short on time, she reveals to the Spartan that it isn't too late, but in order to save Atreus, she requires the heart of Helheim's bridgekeeper. Once she has it, she can create a cure for the boy, but before he leaves, she does warn him that his axe is useless. So, she advises Kratos to return back home and retrieve a weapon more fitting to deal with the situation. Now, it isn't too long till Kratos returns with the heart, so Freya would be successful in curing Atreus. With this done, Kratos thanks the goddess, saying that he wouldn't forget this. After the two leave, 
Freya decides that it's time to right the wrongs of her past. Having observed the relationship between Kratos and Atreus grow, it inspired her to try to make things right with Balder. So Freya would travel out to Midgard in the hopes of finding her son, and her quest would eventually take her to Kratos and Atreus, much to her surprise. But as she approaches them, she notices that something's off. But before she can get her answers, Balder would finally appear, being shocked by the presence of his mother. After decades apart, Freya once again tries to reach out to him for forgiveness, hoping that he may understand why she put a spell on him. But it seems like Balder's feelings towards the situation hasn't changed over the last 100 years. In fact, his anger and spite since then has only grown. So he wishes to finish what he had tried so, so many years ago. Kill Freya. But before this can happen, he would be halted by Kratos, who attempts to deter him from his path of vengeance. But the unhinged god is far too gone, and another fight breaks out, with Freya begging them all to stop. It gets to the point where Freya is forced to use Vanya magic in the hopes of restraining both of them. But it's here where her reality is truly shattered. Atreus takes a punch from Balder, and whilst the demigod does survive this, it is Balder who takes the hit here. When Balder looks at his hand, he sees a mistletoe arrowhead lodged in it, and for the first time in forever, he can feel it. So, Freya's spell would be broken, and Balder would be restored. Far from finished, he now wishes to taste his own blood in battle, and continues to attack Kratos and Atreus. But before he can, Freya, devastated over the thought of her child being harmed, would resurrect the dead body of the giant Falmer. Blinded by her own devoted love to Balder, she tries her best to protect her child. But the sad truth is, is that Freya cannot see that her son is truly lost to her now. With the assistance of Jormungandr, both Freya and Balder are defeated. But before the Aesir god can be killed, he is spared by Atreus and Freya. Defeated and apologetic, Freya for one final time tries to reach out to her son, trying to forge something new from their broken past. But once again, Balder is simply too far gone, as the Aesir god's only desire at this point is to kill her, and this is something she accepts with open arms, believing that if taking her life would mend his own wounds, then that would be a sacrifice she is willing to make for him, as she utters I love you, with Balder's grip tightening around her neck. But before Balder can finish the deed, his grip is broken and he's taken hold of by Kratos, who wishes to stop the cycle of children killing their parents. Thus, to stop the cycle of revenge, he would kill Balder and in turn completely devastate Freya. Feeling hope snatched from her once again, in a fit of rage, Freya threatens bloody vengeance against the Spartan, telling him that she recognises exactly who he is, and that wherever he goes, he spreads violence, evil and death. But Kratos reassures her that he is no longer that person, and this forces a confession out of Kratos to Atreus about the truth of his past, his truth as a god of war. As this goes on, Freya carries the limp body of Balder and presumably takes his body back home, giving him a funeral that is fitting for her pride and joy. But this does not halt her pain. Seeking revenge, Freya would immediately begin to make plans to kill Kratos, but to do so, First, she required her old Valkyrie wings, something thought lost to time. Thus, she would approach Mimir in Tyr's temple and question him about their location. Once satisfied, it is implied that not only is she in pursuit of her old wings, but she is now looking for a way to break Odin's curse, as she strives to regain her lost spirit and a way to slay Kratos, something that we do see in the God of War Ragnarok trailer. So their clash is far from over, and with Freya on the warpath, I am very excited to see how her story unfolds. But for now, this has been everything about Freya in the God of War universe. Now, I can't lie, this was a very hard episode to make. Not because of its length or the amount of research I had to do, but Freya's story is such a tragically written one. Her intentions and desires really do come from a genuine place of care and kindness. But on every single occasion, it has blown up in her face. She has been abandoned by all she cared for, and the only person that she truly, truly loved 
was killed right before her by the very people that inspired her with hope to reach out to her son. Honestly, after covering everything regarding her history in the AC of Vanio War and those that were injured or died by her side, I can 100% understand why she has gone to such extents to protect Boulder. Even if it wasn't entirely right in the way she did it, it makes sense for her character to take so much care for someone she loves. The duality that plays alongside her and Kratos is something both beautiful and horrifying. As we explore the extent a parent would go to protect their child and how this may in turn not be what's best for them. It's really heartbreaking in a way with how this all unfolds, especially with more context for this tragically written goddess. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens to her next in the sequel, but it's really hard for me to not kind of root for the character in a way, because it's very clear that Boulder's death must have definitely been the straw that breaks the camel's back. There's only so far you can bend someone before they snap. But for now guys, this has been it for me. I really do hope you have enjoyed this content and there's plenty more on the way. So now, as always, stay strong, stay well, and keep on fighting as Ragnarok comes for us all. Take care everyone, stay safe.